Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's keynote presentation, Standardizing Point-of-Care Instrumentation, One Institution's Experience, presented by Dr. Nda Sulailam, Director of Clinical Chemistry and Point-of-Care Testing, Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. I am Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sulailam. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you very much, Alexis, and thanks to LabRoots for this invitation to share my work on standardizing point of care instrumentation. Um, as my learning objectives for today, at the completion of this session, uh, you will be able to describe the process of standardizing point of care instrumentation based on our experience and be able to list the challenges associated with standardizing point of care instrumentation. And also uh, the hope is that you'll be able to discuss the advantages of standardizing point of care instrumentation. <clears throat> I do not have any financial disclosures uh, pertaining to this presentation. Point-of-care testing goes a long way to help healthcare institutions provide fast and reliable testing right near the patient. By doing this, point-of-care testing allows for rapid clinical decision-making, which helps a lot with patient de with uh, care delivery. Point-of-care testing instrumentations are portable, as such allowing for uh, them to be able to take uh, to be taken wherever it's needed. For example, in the out in the mission field or uh, in a remote location. And so, it really has gone a long way to increase global access to care. And also, because infrastructure, costly infrastructure, is not really needed for point of care testing instrumentation. This is really uh, may this really makes point of care testing affordable. For, uh, and so allows for areas for resource uh, low areas or areas that are not don't really have a lot of resources to be able to afford point of care testing uh, as opposed to our gigantic lab instrumentation that costs a fortune. And so uh, with this in mind, you can see just how advantageous point of care testing is. And because of these advantages, uh, uh, of point of care testing, it is pretty common or it's pretty common in a lot of across different clinical departments. Uh, and so uh, even though, and so because of this, the fact that it's widely available, different types of instrumentation for the same test, you would frequently find that in the same institution, they're gonna have multiple different tests for uh, multiple different instrumentation for the same test. And so um, knowing this, and so knowing that you could uh, go out and acquire any type of instrumentation that you want, and sometimes you would this would uh, be because of provider, um, because of provider preferences where maybe they came from an institution where a specific type of instrumentation was used and so they want that specific one or maybe just a historical effect for that institution whereby you know different departments go out and acquire their own instrumentation you can actually have all these different types of uh, devices 
for the the same test in the, within the same instrumentation. So with uh, with this being said, the question I would ask you today is: In your institution, do you have different device types for the same test? So uh, because I can't. Uh, the, the, because the system does not have a polling, uh, polling ability for me to see your answers, I'm going to share my experience from a re the recent uh, AACC, American Association for Clinical Chemistry uh, conference in Chicago, uh, at the, where at the point of care coordinators forum, I, sh I asked this question in a, a crowd of about 200 participants, and about and over 80 percent of the participants actually said that yes, in their institutions, they have multiple different device tags for the exact same test. And only about 13% of, uh, of participants said that, no, they do not have this. They actually have this under control. So that's great, right? It's only a, a very small percentage of uh, institutions that don't have this problem. So my institution was no uh, exemption or was not exempt to this uh, point of care device creep, right? So at one point in our institution, we did have for blood gas analysis, not just one, uh, not two, not three, but four different types of point of care instrumentations for blood gas analysis. One handheld, which meant that you could take it anywhere for uh, testing right there to the patient's bedside. And we had three different bench tops, uh, uh, blood gas analyzers, but these were all maintained uh, on a certain, on the patient floor in a blood gas uh, in a blood gas lab per se, and you would have respiratory therapists uh, performing the testing or perfusionists if it was in cardiovascular surgery, and you would have people actually go get the samples and come perform the testing before getting the results back. So uh, this is uh, what was happening for our blood gas anal uh, analysis setup. Meanwhile, for ACT testing, which is another scenario, we had one, two, three different tests types of blood gas of, uh, sorry, of point of care instrumentations for ACT testing from three different vendors in our institution. And so uh, looking at the fact that we had all these multiple device types for the same test, uh, the issue, uh, it presents a lot of different challenges for the institution. And for example, for my institution, looking at this, this could confound the interpretation of the status of the patient, right? Decisions are being made based on the results from these different uh, tests or these different institute uh, from these different instrument types, and so uh, for example, if you have multiple different ACT uh, devices uh, from different areas of the hospital, and you have the same provider who's providing care in those different areas, or you have a patient moving from the OR to the floor, so are moving between the departments, using different ACT devices could actually confound the interpretation of the anticoagulation status of the patient, uh, especially with something with a test like ACT, where this test is this testing is not standardized, and so you're actually getting different results from different instrument types. And looking at hemoglobin, uh, for example, having multiple different instrumentation and a patient being tested uh, in one area of the hospital with a different instrument type and them moving to another area and being tested with another instrument type, this could actually confound the uh, interpretation for the need for transfusion for a patient. And so this actually is a, was a big concern to us. The other challenge that having multiple device types poses is that of decreased efficiency of operators and even of our point of care staff. Uh, having a variety of processes based on the different instrument types, so uh, it, there's a wide variability in the processes that are involved in operating these different instruments, different steps, multiple steps for certain instruments and not as many for other instrument types, different work flows in different areas based on the type of instrument they have. Thus, actually, with this variability and considering that in most healthcare institutions, you have uh, resource 
personnel who are floating between floors or between clinical areas. This actually will cause, will uh, give this learning curve that every time a, a, a resource operate a resource employee who's been working one area for a while and then goes to another area and now has to remember how to use that instrument type. Um, the, because of this learning curve, that could actually increase the number of pre-analytic errors that uh, you would have. It decreases compliance. Sometimes they don't real, they don't remember when did you have to run quality control. And so it, it causes a lot of compliance uh, issues. And also with your point of care staff having to, the point of care staff having to maintain inventory for all of these different in device types which are present in different parts of the hospital, having to do calibration verification for different instrument types, uh, performing uh, instrument to instrument comparison. So there's a lot of things that we could talk about here that uh, point of care staff have to do. So that just things that they wouldn't have to do if they just had one type of uh, point of care instrumentation. So that would greatly decrease the efficiency uh, as well. And so another area that makes it challenging is the fact that this actually increases costs, right? Um, for example, if you have multiple different types, you have to pay maintenance fees, yearly maintenance fees for these different instrument types, which increases the cost versus only paying it for one instrument type. Uh, you have to, um, the, the, the cost for your consumables goes up because you have lower volumes of tests, lower test volumes distributed across different instrument types. Meanwhile, if you have one instrument type, then you have a higher volume, and so that will cost Usually vendors will give you better pricing for larger volumes, uh, testing test volumes. And so uh, this definitely being able to, uh, having multiple different types would certainly increase your cost. And so um, knowing what these challenges are, can you see how advantageous it would be to standardize uh, from multiple different types to uh, hopefully a single instrument type for, uh, a for the same point? A care test, for example, for our blood gas analysis uh, or ACT testing, the example that we use here, uh, certainly you would be able to see, um, it, you would enjoy advantages in three main areas as I've divided here. Uh, you could, you would see improved efficiency with your staff, the operators, uh, they would have reduced learning curves because it doesn't matter what part of the hospital they're working in, they would have to deal with this with the same instrument type. And so they don't have to try to figure out or remember how to operate that instrument. You would all, that would also uh, go to improve your quality because then it will improve compliance. It would decrease your pre-analytic errors uh, because they're doing a similar thing each time. Uh, it doesn't matter what part of the hospital they're working in. Um, they would be uh, using the same, they would be using the same instrument type. Oh, and so this would decrease variability, uh, basically. And the other thing is this also would decrease costs, right? Once you improve efficiency of your personnel, it goes without saying that that would increase costs because that frees up your personnel from doing a lot of things that don't add value uh, to patient care but would rather make their workflows more efficient and improve patient flow as well, uh, which again goes down, goes a long way to improve revenue for the institution. It would decrease your uh, consumable expenses in that you have higher volumes and so you can get better pricing from manufacturers and so, and also it goes without saying, it will decrease your maintenance fees because now you don't have to pay maintenance fees for multiple device types or two multiple vendors, but you cannot just do that to a single or fewer vendors, basically. And so with all of these advantages uh, to standardizing point of care testing, you know, if I were to ask all of you today, should we standardize our point of care instrumentation? Do you want to standardize? Uh, of course, if you're going to get all those advantages, you probably uh, should standardize. And so, uh, but is it as easy as we're 
is it just as easy as uh, saying it standardized and you go out and standardize your multiple instrumentation? Of course not. There are several challenges that uh, you would have to overcome. One of them is change management, right? With change, not everybody wants change. People have been used to using the same type of testing for many years. Maybe they've worked there for several years and they're used to the status quo. And now you're trying to change and bring in new um, new instrument types uh, this or for their area if you're going to standardize this uh, certainly would require f uh, a lot of training them to learn new things and so uh, you'll have to have a plan as to how to manage the change also data collection right so uh, you would have to be able to convince people that you need this change and so collecting that data might not be as easy especially if your instrumentation are not uh, uh, in a phase as was the case in my institution and so all of that data is not readily available and also the cost of acquiring the new instrumentation so if you do decide to standardize to one type of instrumentation that means that uh, that specific type of instrumentation will have to be purchased and made available institution-wide and so that uh, there is a cost associated with that, which would probably be a significant cost to begin with. And so uh, these are all challenges that you would have to face. So taking a look at uh, just uh, focusing a little bit uh, in, in, uh, on change management, which is the biggest challenge, uh, in my opinion, that I think you would probably encounter or that we encountered with uh, standardizing is um, being able to choose an instrument type that would meet the needs of every clinical area that uses that, uh, that has need for that test. And so uh, getting everyone to agree on one specific instrument, especially if it's not the instrument type that they're currently using in their area is gonna be challenging. So you would definitely have to come up with some sort of a strategy as to how to uh, uh, get an instrument type that would meet all of your needs, but also involve them in the process uh, so that you could get um, a wider acceptance of the change. Another thing is uh, you would have to come up with uh, a plan is to uh, training, right? So your personnel will have to learn the new instrument types. And so this is a challenge because now you have to do more of an institution-wide training. So it's not just you training a few personnel, it's you training uh, a, a, a lot of people, several hundreds if you have a, a big institution, if, if you're in a bigger institution like mine, where we have to train hundreds of people, you have to come up with the plan for that. So that would be a challenge uh, and getting people maybe who've worked there for years to learn different types, a new type of instrumentation will be a challenge as well. Um, also, the other uh, key thing, in my opinion, uh, with uh, change management and uh, getting your standardization um, process or your initiative for standardizing clinical care instrumentation to be accepted uh, would be identifying stakeholders for every clinical area that uses that test. So having to be able to pinpoint who is the main person in this area who uh, can to make decisions for an area or who can, uh, who has influence over others in that area uh, is a key thing. It, it's, it would be challenging to identify who those people are. And once you identify them, the next challenge would be convincing them that standardizing is the right thing to do. And so we're gonna see uh, how we did some of that. And so, um, Knowing all these challenges that we're going to, we were going to face, we still decided in my institution to undertake uh, standardization of our point of care instrumentation for blood gas analysis and ACT testing. So today I'm not gonna discuss both of these. I'm gonna use the, uh, our experience with standardizing blood gas analysis as a case study to be able to work you through uh, certain key steps um, uh, that came out of the, our experience in standardizing uh, point of care testing with the hopes that you'll be able to have these as a basis to guide you on your own standardization walk. 
And so this is kind of how our blood gas uh, uh, testing is was set up in our hospital at the time when we decided to undertake point of care standardization for blood gas analysis. And you can see that we had four different types of blood gas uh, analyzers, as I had mentioned earlier. One handheld, which meant it could be taken right there uh, to the patient's bedside, and three benchtop uh, analyzers, which meant that they were either on a cart in certain areas of the hospital or in the blood gas lab. Uh, where testing, the sample would have to be taken to the instrumentation for testing and then results brought back to the provider. And so our, uh, most of our critical care areas used both uh, had, uh, the were using the bench tops. We would have uh, respiratory therapists are the ones that would perform testing on the bench tops in the, our critical or intensive care units. And for the other parts of the hospital, we would have other personnel uh, uh, perform blood gas analysis. And so the goal here is we have four different types of analyzers for blood gas Assessing and we want to go down to one. And so where do we begin, basically? And, and uh, so there is this uh, in, uh, interesting or really good quote that I found on the American Productivity and Quality Center blog from May 30th, 2017. And it basically uh, says what I said before, that for change management to work, the reason must be compelling. And so uh, for us, uh, we realize that if you have to start this, we have to start by coming up with this compelling reason as to why all these different areas that are using this different instrumentation have to come uh, to a consensus to use one type of instrumentation. And so um, the first thing that we did was actually outline all the issues that we identified uh, as a result, uh, all the issues that we had that were a result of us having multiple different types of instrumentation. So we had, I had mentioned those earlier when I talked about the challenges. And so we went down and actually down the list and listed out every single issue that we identified in different areas of the hospital. So certain areas of the hospital had more issues or had more pre-analytic errors or were more prone to pre-analytic errors than other areas of the hospital, but then other areas had more compliance issues. And uh, so we went down the list and listed all the issues that we identified um, uh, as a result, as being a result of having multiple different types of instrumentation. And the uh, next thing that we did was collecting the data, finding data to actually prove that, yes, these were really an issue. If we said that, okay, you have a compliance issue with maybe not running quality control or maybe uh, 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 because our instrument types were not, um, interface we had uh, in some of the areas they were actually printing out the results and walking them to providers and sometimes we would find those results lying around so maybe uh, documenting those each time and involving our compliance officer to actually come and see what was going on you know compiling enough data to be able to prove that we say this is an issue here's the data to uh, to support that. If we said, if we identified pre-analytic error, we try to come up with data to prove that. Uh, costs was an area where, as you're going to see, I'm not really going to have data for costs today because it was challenging for us to prove it. But then we were, we could look for test volumes, uh, the test volumes that we were currently sending to uh, or currently having on each type of instrumentation. And then we looked at the total test volume and then we would ask manufacturers to give us quotes as to what would be our cost if this was our volume and we compared that and that's kind of what we um, use as our proof to say okay this is going to affect costs and then we also use staff efficiency we said you know we're going to cut down the steps from this many steps to this many steps and this would improve efficiency we uh, had a hard time finding hard numbers because a lot of times with point of care testing you have these downstream benefits which sometimes you're not able to quantify 
quantify, as was the case um, for us. And, and so the other thing that, as I mentioned earlier, was we alerted the hospital compliance officer to let them know kind of what are the risks associated with the status quo. If we continue uh, with all these four different types of instruments and the challenges that we had observed or the issues that we identified, what were the risks to patient care, patient safety to the institution? And, uh, and bringing in the compliance officer really helped us make a case um, or strengthen our case for uh, standardization so we could have better buy-in. With all of this data, we now took this, uh, we uh, went ahead to identify different stakeholders in different areas. We started by maybe trying to, ident I started from uh, maybe the medical directors for those areas, if it was an intensive care unit. And sometimes you would go to the medical director and they would identify somebody else to work with you or somebody who could be their representative or work with you for that. So um, that was kind of a starting point. In some areas, we would start with maybe the nursing manager, and then uh, we would slowly find out who the true uh, stakeholder was. And sometimes we would go down the road and then realize, oh, we had the wrong person, and then you have to come back. So uh, uh, we once we identified who the stakeholder was, then we had this body of data and the issues plaguing their specific area to try to get their buy-in to say, yes, um, it is important that we standardize. Yes, this is a problem, and yes, standardizing would be advantageous for us. And so, um, once we got buy-in from all the different stakeholders for all the areas that were utilizing uh, or that had need for blood gas anal analysis, we then went ahead to form a multidisciplinary team. So that's the first step uh, for us uh, that we did. So this multidisciplinary team did consist of key decision makers from all the affected areas. So we had the stakeholders identify individuals, but then we also reached out, especially to the administrative side of all the clinical uh, areas involved or affected, and um, uh, and had them identify, you know, uh, administrative level individuals like nursing managers or uh, and uh, coordinators, uh, but also operators uh, of the instrument. Type. So we wanted to make sure that we had providers who are the people making the decisions based on the results from these instrument types. But then we also had all the way down to those who were the ones actually using the instrumentation and applying the sample to this instrument who had idea uh, about how user-friendly the instrument types were and what they really needed in an instrument. And so, uh, having once we had this multidisciplinary team, and uh, we then tasked them with the uh, goal of uh, identifying an instrument type that would meet the needs, uh, the clinical needs for all these different areas, and um, and make a recommendation as to. Uh, the instrument type. And so we make sure that their objectives were very clear because uh, you don't want to just put out a team and them not have direction as to what they're supposed to do. So we task them with being able to identify an instrument type that would work for all the different uh, areas. And so the first thing that they did, they had to do was assess the situation. And so um, they had to uh, go ahead and assess the different clinical uh, departments that were using that, uh, that had blood gas analyzers and uh, also, so they look at clinical needs, but then also the clinic care devices themselves to see uh, if these devices would uh, work for the different areas. And so uh, what did we assess? So I've listed kind of like a bullet point as to the different things that were on the list and the different things that they looked at in depth that the multidisciplinary team looked at. Um, and I'm not gonna be discussing all of this today in the interest of time, but I will be uh, focusing in on some of these. I would certainly mention things uh, about the clinical needs for each area as we go along, but I'll discuss things like I'll discuss workflow today, you know, cause that was one thing that was of interest to us uh, 
the, also uh, the compliance or quality would be another thing that I'll discuss today and also analytical performance. But certainly here you have a, a list of the different things that um, uh, the multi, our multidisciplinary a committee actually or a team actually went through and looked at these different areas with, uh, and assessed them for each clinical area, basically, to uh, come up with an idea as to what instrument type would be able to meet the needs of uh, all the different areas of the hospital. And so uh, the first thing that I would like to dive in depth into uh, is that we assess would be the workflow. So uh, I kind of mentioned uh, briefly earlier that uh, for our benchtop analyzers, we had uh, so we had three different types of benchtop analyzers. And in our critical care areas or intensive care units, uh, we have these blood gas analyzers sitting in the blood gas lab per se. So it was more of a central location on that floor or that intensive care unit or in that specific intensive care unit. And uh, respiratory therapists uh, are the ones that perform testing on these bench tops. Uh, no other uh, uh, operators in the intensive care unit are trained to use this, but for our respiratory therapists. And so what would happen, I, here I've listed a series of steps that uh, would happen from the uh, test being ordered to the results being uh, provided, being given to the provider. And so you would have the nurse collect the sample. In some areas, it was the um, respiratory therapist collecting the sample. So if the nurse collected the sample, then they'll pay the respiratory therapist to come collect the sample and then go um, run the test. But then they had several different steps to running the test, mainly because our instrument types were not in a phase, and so you can see see that there are multiple uh, uh, steps in between where they assign. They still had to, um, they would enter in the, the, the patient information, the reagent information, uh, uh, assign an accession number, log into the LIS system to um, assign this accession number, and then scan, get a barcode, scan it, you know, uh, run the test, and then put in that information to LIS system. So you can see that there were so many tests. So I've condensed all those tests to just nine steps on here, as you can see in this chart. However, if you actually looked at all the subtest steps that they had to go through, there are about 23 to 27 steps. And so this goes without saying that uh, you could have multiple different errors happen. So the more steps you put in a uh, in in a scenario in a situation, the more room for error uh, you're providing. And so, and the more variable the process. For example, if they were in the NICU, was a different process. In the PICU, it's a different process. And so, uh, with all of this variability, there you're just giving room for error. And so, um, we did have error happening because of that. And so, you can see that. Uh, with this workflow, it would have it would be of benefit to be able to shrink this down. And one big thing that would benefit this process would be interfacing the instrument. But because we had so many different instrument types in the instrument institution, the cost to interface every single type of uh, bench top analyzer was just too much. And so the institution uh, couldn't do it, couldn't in, uh, interface all these different instrument types. But because we had made this more of a, an, a standardization initiative, we were able to get buying from the institution, if you can give us one instrument type, we would be able to provide the resources for it. Another thing that we did was tie our standardization goal, uh, uh, standardizing our blood gas analyzers or, uh, to a goal, to a hospital goal. So one of the, the hospital had this, had started this initiative for improving patient care delivery. And one of, a part of that initiative was bringing care closer to the patient's bedside. And so if we were able to decrease the steps that uh, we're taking the respiratory therapist away from the patient's bedside for anywhere from 10 to 40 minutes because of the sheer number of steps. And uh, if we could decrease this and make make it such that the respiratory therapist could spend more time at the patient's bedside uh, doing what the respiratory therapist does to make sure that uh, ensuring the welfare of the patient rather than 
uh, spending it in a blood gas lab, um, running a test. This certainly was uh, was going to improve uh, patient care delivery. And so by tying that to the hospital goal, we were able to get more support and buy-in for um interfacing our instruments. So uh, we were able to assess these workflows. We had people on the floors observing the different workflows in the different areas and gathering information as to the variability of the processes and as to how, uh, where point of care would add value in these steps by uh, definitely shrinking down the different steps to just a few steps. Uh, the other thing that we assessed was the quality, uh, and uh, one of the things that we chose to assess quality was the pre-analytic errors. And the specific pre-analytic errors that we chose to really gather data on, just because it was, since our instrument types were not interface, it was just hard to get uh, a lot of uh, data, was corrected reports. So we chose to take a look at the different corrected reports that were being um, uh, 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 done or for every single month. And so we did this for every, for the different areas. And so what I'm showing you are correct reports for one of our, uh, one of the clinical areas uh, in our hospital. And so you can see that uh, the character reports were around 14 or let's say on average around 12 every uh, uh, per month. Uh, and here I'm showing you data for seven months. And when we looked, drilled down to see, you know, uh, to see what the different errors were and if what the specific problems were, we could, you can see that uh, the biggest error, uh, the main reason for the errors we're having were using the wrong spec type. So for example, reporting a result on uh, and saying that it was an arterial sample, for example, rather than meanwhile, it was a venous, it was a blood gas result on a venous sample. So that was by far the biggest pre-analytic error that we found in this area and across multiple areas. But then we also had issues with results being reported on the wrong patient, right? And you had duplicate orders on the same patient and incorrect uh, results on an analyte. So, um, and different and other error types that we could not really identify, but they would do a corrected report. So again, because our instruments were not really interfaced and there was really no electronic way for us to catch this, these are just the the uh, character reports on the errors that were caught. So this lets us know that there are probably other errors that were not caught. So this is certainly a patient safety issue that, you know, um, again, gave us even more compelling reason uh, for standardizing and getting the, the instrumentation in a phase so that we could prevent some of this error. And so what I'm showing you now, the next thing that we looked at were and that was analytical performance. So while the multidisciplinary team was assessing all these different areas, the point of care staff were performing um, an, uh, an analytical method comparisons between these four um, different instrument types and our laboratory instruments, which were the reference instrument for our institution. And so um, one thing that you can see from this list here, uh, I'm showing you the menu of tests for our bench tops and our handhelds, is the fact that bench tops, our bench tops did have a larger menu, right? They were uh, able to perform the biggest difference with the handheld is the fact that they uh, perform co-oximetry. And so you get measured hemoglobins, which some of our areas pointed out was the main test uh, clinical need that they had. They needed a measured hemoglobin. They would uh, calculate hemoglobin will not work for them because they had more hemodiluted patients, uh, which would interfere with uh, conductivity, which is the main method that's used for um, that would provide calculated hemoglobin results. And uh, our handhelds had fewer tests. And so it would be more advantageous if you could just go with the bench tops. And so uh, we did prov uh, do analytical performance uh, method comparisons between these instrument types and uh, our point of care instruments and the lab. And on, uh, but today I'm only going to discuss the comparison, the results from uh, three different analytes highlighted here in red, sodium, potassium, and hemoglobin, mainly because these were the some of the analyze that the analyze that some of the areas uh, talked about 
is being very important for them and the analytes that um, uh, we were closely looking at. For our blood gases and the different analytes, we didn't really see a significant difference. They, they, we, had, we showed really good comparison uh, with lab. And so starting with uh, a method comparison of sodium to uh, the laboratory method, what you can see from this Deming regression plot showing uh, our blood gas analyzers of point of care instrumentation on the y-axis and our lab instrumentation on the x-axis is the fact that uh, you can see that bench top two is showing a negative bias to the lab. Um, you can see the equivalent, the line of equivalency is the dotted line, which is in black. And the bench top two is showing a negative bias. Meanwhile, the other uh, different instrument types are showing a positive bias. So just looking at this, you can see that there was a variability in performance when it came to sodium. And so looking at this data a different way uh, by looking at the blend Altman uh, plots, which is a bias plot. Uh, so this shows us the bias uh, a little bit more closely, uh, the bias that these blood gas analyzers had to lab. You can see that uh, bench top one had uh, showed the positive bias and the mean bias is around 3.3. So the total allowable error for uh, sodium is four. So um, for us, even though that's within the allowable error, we were like, huh, that's that's kind of high, you know, especially if you look at that spread, you can see that there were several analytes there that were outside the total, oh, certain several points there that were outside the total allowable error. Bench top two is the one that uh, shows, it actually shows uh, the mean uh, bias there is more close, it's, it's not as large. And and the um, uh, bench top three also has good performance. And our handheld did show uh, a, a positive bias as well, but it's, again, it's still within the total allowable error. So just looking at these sodium results, it does uh, look from, based on this bench top two and three showed the best performance for with sodium. If you're looking at potassium here, this the Deming regression plot, you can see that uh, potassium actually sh uh, shows really good performance, right? So you uh, the results are all, uh, there's really good comparison with lab. And if you look at the bias plots, it's the same. So potassium is one area that they were a little bit concerned about because of pre-analytic errors. But you can see that we did have really good comparison to lab. And so potassium wasn't a worry for us. So looking at hemoglobin, um, you can, uh, looking at the performance of hemoglobin, you can see that two instruments, uh, bench top three and the handheld show negative bias to uh, lab. Meanwhile, uh, bench top one and two showed equivalent or slightly positive bias to lab. And so one thing that I want to uh, point out, which I omitted to point out at the beginning, is the population of patients that we use for this study. We use whole blood samples, uh, leftover whole blood specimens from patients that were on the going cardiovascular surgery. So this is a population of patients that would most likely be hemodiluted. As I said before, um, for methods that use conductivity, if uh, uh, a sample of patients hemodiluted or bleeding heavily, this would uh, give falsely negative results with conductivity. Conductivity actually, uh, uh, point of care instrumentation that use conductivity to give you a calculated hemoglobin results usually would measure the hematocrit by conductivity and then calculate a hemoglobin result. And so if a patient was hemodiluted, you would generally have falsely uh, negatively biased results uh, compared to what they really are. And so uh, looking at these uh, results here, you can tell that those methods, the instrument types that use spectra spectrophotometry to measure uh, hemoglobin to give you a measured result did show good performance or comparable performance to the laboratory instrument. Meanwhile, the two methods that uh, point of care instrumentation that we're using conductivity did show the negative bias. So this does, um, this is kind of what we expected to see if you were using um, 
patient samples that patients uh, that were hemodiluted. And so you can tell already that uh, we would not be able to use bench top three. Uh, that bias is too large outside the total allowable error for um, for hemoglobin and bench, uh, and we would not be able to use that for in this population of patients. And even our uh, handheld should, even though it's within the total allowable error, uh, our provider said no. This is this is still not acceptable, right? It's not acceptable performance. So again, we would not use this. Just goes to show that we would not use this. Uh, instrument type in this population of patients. And so, uh, however, because we were interested in the handheld uh, because of the value that it could add in being able to allow our respiratory therapists or our operators to be right there at the patient's bedside providing results in real time right there and not taking them away from the uh, bedside. Uh, we wanted to take a look to see, you know, are we are we going to see the same thing in just routine samples, whole blood samples that were sent to the lab for routine testing, samples that are coming from all the other floors of the hospital and not from cardiovascular surgery. So these are samples that were not likely to be hemodiluted. And so when we did do that comparison to lab, we saw a similar uh, uh, performance to those instrument types that had spectrophotometry. So we did see that slightly positive bias. Um, and so we did not see that negative bias that we observed with the hemodilated samples. And so this did tell us that, yes, we could use this instrument uh, in a population of patients that are not hemodiluted, which would be in our other areas of the hospital. Uh, and so just looking at the analytical performance data, the recommendation just based on that performance data would be benched up too because it didn't have sodium issues, uh, a, a high uh, positive bias as we saw with bench top one. It didn't have issues with uh, conductivity. And so bench top two would be the instrument type that was recommended based on analytical performance. Uh, the handheld uh, would be could be used because it did show good performance sodium and potassium, but then uh, it showed good performance with hemoglobin in uh, certain populations of patient and not in others. So you would not be able to use it institution wide, but in certain areas. And so uh, armed with all of the assessment data, the next step would be now look at all of this data, including analytical performance, clinical needs, easy uh, ease of use of instrumentation. So we wanted part of the assessment was having each clinical area give pros and cons of their instrument type, why they would want to keep it or why they wouldn't want to keep it. So all of this information was used uh, to come up with a recommendation, uh, was used by the multidisciplinary team to come up with a recommendation. And so if you remember, the goal was to uh, standardize to one instrument type. However, because of the hospital's uh, goal to keep care, uh, to bring care closer to the patient's bedside, to improve uh, care delivery, uh, we did, uh, the multidisciplinary team recommended using handheld uh, in the areas of the hospital that um, didn't have interference with uh, hemoglobin or uh, and use the bench top in those areas that did need measured hemoglobins, for example, in a cardiovascular uh, surgery area. So uh, these were the concentrations that went, I've listed you here, the concentrations that went in deciding to use both the handheld and standardized to one handheld and one bench top rather than just to a single bench top, which would give us all the um, tests that we would want or need. And so, um, uh, and so these were the considerations that went into making this decision. And after making this decision, we didn't just want to implement it. We decided to take the pilot. Uh, uh, we 
took a piloted approach. We piloted um, just using a handheld in uh, a certain area of the hospital that did not uh, require measured, did not really want measured hemoglobin or did not really need measured hemoglobin and only use uh, a bench top if coaxometry was needed. And so for the purposes of the pilot, we did take away the bench tops from that floor. So we did the pilot in the PQ. The reason why we chose the PQ is because they were uh, the with the area that were most accepting of the change. So you do not want to go in and pilot in an area that does not want change. So an area that uh, is more accepting of the changes would be the best area for the pilot. And so uh, this uh, the pilot needed that we educate providers because they were going from always having co symmetry with every sample that was tested um, for, and to a situation where they were not going to have coaxymetry unless they they ordered coaxymetry. And so a lot of training went in for the providers, our residents, our uh, nurses, basically everyone for the operators. There was a lot of training. And then we implemented this and we went ahead with a pilot for five months. During this pilot, we uh, did uh, collect quite a bit of data. We wanted to see, you know, how often did they really need coax? And one thing we found was, before they were always getting coax during this time when they didn't have coax on the floor really throughout the five months nobody ordered coax for this area and so and here i'm showing you data from the other areas uh and you can see that the area like a cardiac intensive care unit that did need coax metric because they had so they have mm, patients were on nitric oxide treatment and that causes met hemoglobinemia. So they need a co-oximetry for the management of these patients. You can see that those areas do get uh, co-oximetry testing. Meanwhile, the area that doesn't really need it, now we've done more test utilization where they're not really getting that test when they don't need it. And so now they, they would still, they still have that test available to them if they need it, but it just has to be run uh, on a different floor. And so based on this, we, uh, on the outcomes of our pilots, we, it confirmed that for certain areas, they probably do not need a bench top um, to be on that floor. And so that meant there were fewer areas where we would need to put in the bench tops, for example, in our cardiovascular surgery or R. And so uh, on here, again, I just put a quick list of the different things, uh, information that we collected from the pilot. We took a look again at the workflow. Did we make any improvements? Did we add value to care? Um, how many instruments are needed? Uh, so that this will give us an idea to more white implementation, implementing it this throughout the hospital. So after providing the recommendation and piloting this in one area and having the information that we need to be able to, uh, for different areas, we went ahead to implement this in the hospital. So um, institution-wide. So we didn't do the implementation all at once. We still decided to do it area by area so that we could have time to focus on the single area, work out all the kings, uh, before moving on. So during the pilot, we initially wanted to do it for three months, but it extended to five months because we were able to identify issues which we were able to fix and work out and uh, before moving on to implementing it in other areas. And every area we realized was unique. And so um, we were able to do that. And so we, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go through the last few slides. And so you can see that implementing the main thing would be training. Uh, you have to train several different uh, operators. In this case, we had hundreds of operators. We had uh, tens of providers to train. Um, and then you have to set a goal life date and make sure everyone understands exactly uh, what's going to happen uh, on that goal life date and how that's going to happen and what the new workflows would be. And so what did we gain from standardizing? It goes without saying we gained staff efficiency. And so far, we've been able to get improved uh, uh, 
not just personal satisfaction, but also provider satisfaction, right? We were able to cut down our, uh, our pre-standardization uh, testing times, which would go anywhere from 10 to 40 minutes to under five minutes. It didn't matter if they were using a bench top or not. The main reason for this improvement was because of uh, our bench tops becoming standardized. And we even got a provider telling uh, me one day, like, this is point of care at its best because they were so happy with the improvement or the value that point of care added to their uh, to the patient care. And another thing that we gained was improved quality. And so you can see, as we discussed earlier, our pre-standardization corrected reports in uh, that one specific area that I shared with you. And you can see post-standardization, sometimes we would get two, maybe three um, corrected reports, but that's mainly because of the, uh, that those were all because of uh, sample types. So sometimes they would say they want arterial samples and then they would uh, change their minds as to what testing, but then forget to switch the sample type. And so uh, that was mainly the type of error, but with education, now that error is almost non-existent. Cost savings, we were able to show that, yes, we did save costs. Again, I don't have hard numbers for you, but they were able to realize that, oh, we no longer have four different maintenance fees, but now we just have two maintenance fees. And so again, and also because of the increased volumes, we were able to get decreased uh, uh, co um, costs for our supplies from our vendors. And so uh, knowing these advantages and kind of what you could gain, uh, uh, would you be up for of, uh, taking the challenge and actually going through standardization. Um, again, going back to the AACC in 2018, when I asked this question, most of the people, everyone basically 100% <laughs> said yes, we do want to standardize because there are so many advantages. So just to summarize, um, again, uh, to go through standardization, I think that the most important part is certainly uh, provide, doing the groundwork, getting that compelling data that you need or compelling information that you need to be able to convince uh, uh, your institution that change is needed. Uh, because this is more like a foundation. If you do uh, do really good groundwork, then uh, you won't then, uh, that would be most of the challenges that you would have to overcome with, especially when it comes to change management. And so the next thing would be uh, forming a multidisciplinary team, assessing the situation, providing your recommendation, and we do recommend piloting it in an area that is very acceptable of the change and then going ahead with your implementation and not forgetting to put in place processes that would allow for you as the uh, point of care uh, department to monitor and maintain compliance and quality of this testing. So you can actually see this, uh, this uh, flow that I have on here. Uh, it published in the Clinical Lab News by AACC uh, in Bench Matters section. And also I have those links at the bottom here and also uh, as uh, scientific shorts by the AACC Academy. So you can certainly see these texts in more details um, uh, as to what I experienced worse in those two uh, publications. So with that, I would take any, I would say thank you for listening and I would take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sulailam for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, how did you decide on what four blood gas instruments to evaluate when there are so many on the market? Um, for us, that was a, a no-brainer, mainly because, uh, as I said before, we 
started out with four different types of instrument, four instrument types for point of care testing. Um, because we had those four instrument types and in looking at the publications or in uh, discussing with colleagues from other institutions, it turned out that those instrument types were also the most commonly used instrument types uh, for blood gas analysis in most institutions. And also there were several publications sh uh, showing that these instrument types had good performance and uh, uh, and in meeting clinical needs in different areas. And so uh, with that, we decided to evaluate just those instrument types that we had, which were four, and not go out and look for new instrument types, even though there were newer instrument types on the market and we did have people approaching us. So uh, we decided to start with what we have. And I would advise for areas to start with what they have unless they are not satisfied with what any of the things they have in-house and they want to look uh, for something new or something outside or new and improved, then that's when I would say, okay, go ahead and look at something else. But we started with what we have. With what we have. And it looks like, <laughs> and it looks like we have time for one more question. In your view, okay. what was the most critical factor in your successful standardization of point of care testing instrumentation? Um, in my view, I would say it would be identifying stakeholders because uh, that was, I didn't show it in my talk, but that was the, I would say, as we say in chemistry, rate limiting step for us. That was like the bottleneck. That was the part that delayed us the most. Having, being able to identify who's the main, who's the key person in that clinical area that we needed to talk to. Because several times we would uh, do so much work and we would go to the drawing board just to realize that, oh, we have the wrong person. And then we would have to come back and then start from scratch, get that person convinced and then get their buy-in before we start all over. And they're like, well, this is really our need in this area. It's not this, it's this. This is what we want to do. This is what we are want to accomplish. And so uh, in my view, I would say identifying the stakeholders early on is key, you know, and would make an already challenging uh, situation go a lot smoother. I would like to once again thank Dr. Sue Lilam for her presentation. I would also like to thank Labrits for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of 2019. You will receive an email from Labrits letting you know when this webcast will be available for re Play announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.